Welcome everybody to day eight of the Collective Trauma Summit. My name is Robin Alfred, one of the co-hosts of the summit, and I'll be your host also for today's panel discussion on the Pocket Project, activating the power of group coherence. In today's conversation, we're going to talk with Thomas Hubel and Yehudit Sasportas, who together founded the Pocket Project in 2016. Kosha Joubert, CEO of the Pocket Project, and Laura Calderon de la Barca, who is a core member of the Pocket Project. And we're going to be talking about the project itself and the topic of activating the power of group coherence. And now maybe to introduce our panelists a bit more fully. Thomas Hubel, as you may have gathered through the, the summit, if you've been tuning in, is the convener of the summit. He is a speaker, author, and founder of the Academy of Inner Science. Thomas has worked with more than 100,000 people worldwide through workshops, multi-year training programs, and online courses. Thomas also has a forthcoming book, Healing Collective Trauma, a process for integrating our intergenerational and cultural wounds that will be published this November. Yehudit Sasportas, in addition to being co-founder of the Pocket Project with Thomas, is an Israel-based artist and professor at Bezalel Academy in the Fine Art Department. She works in a number of media, including painting, sculpture, and video, to create what she calls mental landscapes, large format black and white images of natural scenes that transition from the serenely beautiful to the hazily disconcerting. Yehuda has recently begun working with film and computer animation, adding another level of experimentation to her already very innovative creations. Kosha Joubert is CEO of The Pocket Project, where she works on topics of collective and transgenerational healing worldwide. She has been studying with Thomas for 15 years and has served as a mentor on many of his online courses. And she is an international facilitator, trainer, and consultant. Kosha was born in South Africa and grew up under apartheid. And in a new phase of The Pocket Project, she will be co-leading, actually with me, an international lab on European colonialism in Africa. And she will also be co-leading a lab on gender-based violence. And last but by no means least, Dr. Laura Calderon de la Barca is a psychotherapist, cultural analyst, collective healing researcher, and educator. She is a graduate of the Pocket Project training and is part of Thomas's assistance team. In the Pocket Project, she liaises between Thomas and the graduates from the training and she's part of the exploration groups on research, indigeneity, and colonialism. In the international labs, Laura will head the Mexican branch of the lab on Latin American collective trauma exploration. So those are our four members of today's panel, and I'm very happy now to pass to Thomas for Thomas, your introductory remarks. Thank you, Robin, and hello and welcome everyone. And hello and welcome also to all our panelists, uh, Judith, Laura, and Kosha. So yes, we are here today um, to introduce to you all um, the Pocket Project, a project that is dear to my heart and it's dear to all of our hearts uh, so far. And it's the nonprofit activity and the kind of social engagement activity of our work. And um, I will give you a short overview and then we will hear from everyone, uh, from Judith and Laura and Kosha, and then we will engage in a conversation to um, deepen our under, or your understanding of the Pocket Project through um, engaging different parts of the Pocket Project for you so that you can get a, an overview. And if you're interested, of course, you're most welcome to engage in any form that we will present uh, within this hour. So it started, I mean, since Judith and I are married, it started at the Shabbat table uh, four years ago, that one day Judith came up to me and said, uh, Thomas, I, th I have a great idea. And many of our conversations start that way. I have a great idea. One of us comes up with a great idea. And in this case, she said, Thomas, I have a great idea. I think you should combine 
many things that you did in the past and we found uh, together with, with my work, uh, we found the pocket project. And, uh, and I said the pocket project and Judith will speak a little bit later uh, about the name, the pocket project. And so we started to talk and at the beginning I said, what do you mean? And, how? and then more and more, um, the idea of the nonprofit, the pocket project has been born. And um, so it, it combines in a way, the work that I've been doing the last, for the last 18 years um, and the work that Judith has done for equally long time through art and uh, through her exploration of trauma and collective trauma and the artistic path and her teaching. But Judith, you can say a little more afterwards to that. And, um, and so approximately four years ago, uh, we started with an engaged uh, core team of some members left in the meanwhile and some others joined us and we created a, um, a first training program. We said, okay, we need to look how can we start working on collective trauma. And I think Laura will speak to that later. We gathered 150 people from all around the world, from 150, 150, uh, 39 countries. And we, we created a one year training program, which taught us a lot. And I think we explored together a lot. And I think you can speak to that in depth, Laura, a bit later. And so, and the many of the people that went through the training got more and more engaged in what today is the pocket project as an organization that started to work in different areas around the world and explore the dimension of collective trauma. And of course, some time has passed and I have finished uh, also my book, which uh, you know, it's you see it online on the website. It's gonna be published uh, in the middle of November. And so on the one hand, the pocket project is here to, we are here to create like a global movement, a global en system of engagement where everyone who is deeply interested in kind of the integration work on collective trauma. And, and we all know since we, we see the summit here, that it's an interdisciplinary approach. We need multiple streams of intelligence to come together. We need many, many competencies. And so at the moment we are, we are in the phase where we are, before we called them pocket uh, groups, and now we are transitioning to international labs, which means that locally engaged uh, groups of research, as you heard, uh, Robin already shared some of them, where we explore local collective traumatization or topics like violence, gender violence, or um, more specific uh, global um, traumatizations that are more uni or that are that we find in in every country basically, and so we are we are in the process of developing that. And you will hear later also from Kosha more about the practicality and, uh, and what that is uh, specifically. And so on, there is a possibility for over the next years to engage more and more areas around the world to deeply explore, like to drill in a way, uh, a deeper hole into the architecture of our collective traumatization and to bring more awareness into those. At the same time, we are creating right now a, a program within the Academy of Inner Science as it's, it's gonna become a school for collective trauma integration with a three year training program that is modular, that can be composed out of different courses that we do for learning to facilitate collective trauma processes. Because in the last 18 years, while I was studying collective trauma through many, many processes that we did up to pretty large processes with large groups of people, I got to understand that the complexity of individual traumatization, 
transgenerational traumatization, collective traumatization, as we uh, saw through or uh, seeing throughout the summit that the complexity of the topic is pretty large because we are all part of it. And so we want to um, offer an in-depth training program and then the social engagement surface for it where we can create groups all around the world to um, dive deeper and learn from the architecture of collective trauma about the nature of collective trauma. I think that's, that's our, our aim. And we are also in the process of setting up like a design center for collective trauma processes for countries, for example, or large areas or where or large organizations where we design processes and implement processes for for states where the governments or large organizations want to collaborate with us in designing a healing process on a much larger scale. So that's in the making and all of this is going to be um, displayed on our new website that will come up soon, I think within the next month and where all that information will be available. And so I think we have like a pretty large vision that I would like every one of you to speak to um, a little bit from your angle. But I think we, are, we see that, that collective trauma as a humanity-wide issue in a way that is at the beginning hard to grasp. But when we dive deeper into the nature, it, I believe we, there's so many pearls, there's so much to learn, and there, there's so much wisdom buried in the collective trauma nature of our world that I think it's an, it's an amazing it kind of, it's a new exploration. It's an exploration that takes us into a depth, I think that, has, that is unexplored in, in the deep parts of it. And that's why I see a lot of potential for the healing flourishing and also for the great global challenges that we are facing right now. And, um, and I will share a little bit more maybe later, but I want to hand it over now to um, our panelists. So maybe Judith, do you want to take it from here? And yeah. Of course. So it's beautiful uh, also to hear you uh, describing the path and the way that how this project, you know, was um, downloaded itself into life. Um, I can share that as an artist, as being your partner and following your work as well for many years, it was quite clear for me from the beginning that, um, you know, we are kind of like interested in the same thing, but from very, very, very different perspective and very, very different way of practicing me as an artist and you in the way that, um, you know, you were exploring and researching um, trauma. And um, I can share here that um, the way that it started was very, you know, following your work and, and finding a very interesting connection between even the, um, what I've experiencing in your groups that your ability to tune in with one subjective person that went through a very i would say intense experience that will all define as traumatic um, and this experience was uh, on one level his own story but at the same time function as part of a bigger story of a community of a, you know collective field the moment that uh, a very intense and precise process was able to take place in the space, I was amazed to see how it was resonating with 100 or 200 participants in the group. So there was a very interesting connection between the precise entombment with one person, you know, the individual, and the way that it resonates with the, the rest of the group. And I've realized immediately that there is not a a necessity to give the same session to all the participants. So something was already uh, showing me that there is a very um, interesting connection to what I do in my art. And I can share here that 
I felt like, wow, it's interesting. Um, I, by myself, went through um, an intense experience that, you know, by all of us would be, can be defined as traumatic experience. I realize, and the narrative is not important. And I, in purpose, don't go into the details because the, the story is not the point. I've realized that since the, you know, this, ex I went through this experience as an individual person. I experienced something and uh, that time I went to art school and I started dealing with art and um, I've realized that I, I, I maybe, maybe there was something that I could feel that the moment that this unexpected experience took place in my own life, I felt that there is on one level like a kind of a crack that I got open and uh, synchronization or the coherency between me and reality and life you know, something, you know, broke or something, it, you can say, you know, I felt like if the lands are moving, literally. And there were two possibilities that I had. One was try to get back by building kind of, you know, um, bridges, you know, just to come back to the point um, that I felt individually being kicked out from the highway. And uh, the other possibility was, was, of course, more painful, was to stay in your isolated island, in this island that will, from my experience at that time, was will never be in time again, in the present moment again. And then I felt that I, I start noticing that this valley or this gap or this space that got open, you know, between and isolated my own island that once felt for me as part of this bigger island, I felt like, you know, there are spaces, holes, and I start diving in those spaces, uh, not because I choose and not because it was, you know, comfortable. There was not so many other things to do. But what I want to say is that I've realized after 30 years, of course, of working by meeting you 17 years ago, that there is a similarity between the work that I decided to dedicate in my life to and, and it was into, you know, to start uh, bringing all my knowledge as artists into, the, into those, you know, valleys, into those pockets and teaching many, many generations of, uh, you know, students for years, I've realized, oh my God, all of them carries those undigestible life information. And I always call it like, oh, those, oh, this pocket and this pocket. And I've realized that is in the individuals, we carry those pockets, but as a community, as collective, we have, we have one big pocket that consists out of all those pockets. So the pocket, even the name, came from this, you know, anatomy of this space that I felt that suddenly was there unexpectedly. In Judaism, we have different types of meditation. One of the type is, you know, meditation in hell, you know, dive and practice a presence in a very uncomfortable place, space. And I said, okay, so I start you know, practicing what I know, but in this uncomfortable space. And then I've realized after a while that this is not so much my own uncomfortable space. By through staying in this uncomfortable space, I start having an access to a lot of information that we will all call today underground information, subconscious realms. And I felt like, oh, there is something there. So by creating art, films, sculptures, um, I felt that um, I could charge them with this information and bring them back into the public spaces as museums, as you know, and, and then I felt that the community, the others, the people that had no idea about the story because I put a lot of information with neutralizing the story, start being interested but seriously and quite profound in the information that those objects were charged with or were carrying. So the pocket, what this was the beginning, why a pocket? A, you know, a metaphor for undigestible life information that is wasting, waiting for you and later for the community to be felt in order to bring it back, in order to include it again, because we need something. And the rest, you know, you know it developed with uh, all the method of how you work, how you, your research, and, you know, from here we can continue and see what are the practical way, what are the structures that this information can be available and be, you know, spread. So we have those wonderful people, Kosha, Laura, 
I pass it on to you and then we can continue from there. Thanks so much to Hudit. Um, and it was really inspiring to hear you talk about this and I could feel the resonances in me with what I would like to share. So I, where I would like to start is sharing a little bit about why I got interested in this in the first place. And the first thing to mention there is that I am a Mexican woman who is of both indigenous and Spanish ancestry. And so I've felt within myself that the collective trauma living inside of me, you know, feeling on the one hand, the um, the, the, the disdain of the Spaniards uh, to the, towards the indigenous, the pain and the rage of the other side, just, you know, bringing it together inside of me was just such a challenging experience to have growing up. So I've, I've needed to find some way of healing and come, bringing these two parts of me together in a way that would allow me to fully show up in the world. And that was a really challenging thing. So part of how I, I work with this is I created a PhD and that was a healing session for my country. Um, but that required a whole bunch of other people to get that off the ground. And that I finished in 2007. I found Thomas's work at the end of 2016 and joined the Pocket Project in 2017. That's how I arrived to this, to this um, space. And um, I was really interested in the connection between the individual and the collective. That's really what has been driving me. And what I found in the training was a space where you know the complexity that this field has uh, was being able to find some answers that um, started with a layering of a learning process where we started to become capable of creating coherence within us. Uh, Thomas has developed something called um, a transparent communication and a system called the three sync where you synchronize what you feel in your body, your emotions, your mind, and that way you start to create an inner coherence. After that, there's um, subtle competencies that we had to learn to be able to attune to fields. So um, being able to stay present, be able to start to feel both yourself and another at the same time, noticing where you can't. All that has been part of the practice that for three years with those of us who, you know, from that initial cohort of 150 people, there's still about 40 to 50 of us that are consistently meeting every week almost to continue learning and healing together. Um, and that has been really one of the most precious things that I got out of being in the Pocket Project. The community of people who continue with, with such commitment and dedication and love are really actually one of the core pieces in how we can create the capacity to heal collective trauma. As the collective wounding is collective in nature, we actually need collectives. To, to be able to hold these kinds of energies. You know, somebody with the skill that Thomas has, you know, can do it himself facilitating the whole thing. I know I can't, and I don't think there's, I don't know how many other people in the world can, but I know that many of us have wanted to, to be able to contribute to this important work. And so being able to do that through what we've learned in the Pocket Project has been really, really significant. So, um, I'd just like to bring in the voices very quickly of three of my colleagues from the Pocket Project, uh, speaking also to what they got from this. And uh, one of them is naming how there was a much bigger picture that became accessible through being in the Pocket Project. And uh, Luis Mara names that the training allowed me to see that my purpose is also an internal integration of bringing the trauma of my ancestral lines through me to meet both the colonized and the colonizer. In terms of the subtle capacities, Sam Bedham Randall shares that presencing, attunement, coherence, and many other practices we learned together brought my spiritual longing into a concrete focus that aligns with the healing work that has been my work for many years. And regarding the, the graduate sang of the community, uh, Cheryl Sarna says, I am eternally grateful for uh, Thomas and you, this creation of the Pocket Project, for I am committed to this path and love, love the people I have met along the way and what we are learning together. And I would like to, if you could help me with um, sharing now, I think, Kosha, you're, you're the one doing this. I'd like to share with you a bit of my understanding 
uh, that, you know, some of the things that I learned from the pocket project. So if we could go to the first slide, I'd like to share my understanding of coherence. And I'd like to name that as a linguist, I always like to look at the origins of words because words are crystallized experience. Some are crystallized wisdom and some crystallized trauma. But here, when we look at coherence, its, it's origins are from the word uh, coerere in Latin, and forgive my pronunciation. And this is made up of two parts, co, which is an indicator of togetherness, and herere, which means to stick. So you might recognize cohere and adhere as words that have this root. And um, to adhere means to stick to something. However, cohere is to stick together. So coherence, can be understood as a condition where different elements in a whole are synchronized or aligned in a way that they formed a unified whole. So I'd like to share it now in this next slide. Um, so um, you did share it about how there is this individual part that has a whole other larger um, way of being understood. And that speaks to the concept of fractals. So fractals are self um, similar structures that have different levels of manifestation. So um, this is um, one way of looking at uh, an understanding from academia, what we're actually doing. I'll just then go to the next one really quickly. And so I'd like to speak to our nature as both particle and wave. And when we look at, you know, one of these images shows the Mexican way going around in a stadium. And that is what's called a soliton. That is uh, a one single wave that runs through um, a field. And that is exactly what Jehudit was speaking to when she was mentioning that when there's this deep attunement and healing be brought into a space, it can ripple out. So I'll leave it there for now and hand it over to you, Kosha, to share more with us about the future of the project. Well, th this last piece, I'll just uh, say that really quickly, is about when we're inside of collective trauma, it feels like we're inside of this place that has all this pressure as though we were inside like underwater and it's hard to breathe there. But when we become aware that what we're experiencing is collective trauma, then it's as though we come out to breathe and all of a sudden we can have this understanding that there's all this water around us, there's all this collective trauma around us and we can still be in it, but have a different experience while being in it. So thanks so much and Kosha, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas, Judith, Laura. It already feels so rich and I am just deeply grateful to yeah, be invited to step into the field of the Pocket Project in my new role as CEO and to, in a way, support the coherence in our field, all of us together, all of you watching right now, you know, but also the coherence between the vision that Thomas and Judith allow to come into this world and support the manifestation of that vision in ways that are coherent with the original impulse. So, yeah, personally, I was born in South Africa under apartheid, which I think was one of the most visible systemic expressions of the crack that you did spoke about. Apartheid means separation, a system of deep structural injustice. And even as a child, I woke up with that visibility of this crack in my everyday life, you know, and for some reason I didn't numb to it. It just became more and more obvious as I went to an all white school, but I, I lived in a country of rainbow people, right? So, um, yeah, I became very involved in the anti-apartheid movement in my youth, but also had a moment of real inner lostness when Nelson Mandela was released. It was clear that the apartheid system was over, and I felt like social activism is actually not my pure path. And I went on a pilgrimage through the country of South Africa at that time, just walking the land, walking the spaces that I wasn't allowed to enter before. 
And I ended up in a community where black and white people live together and learn together. And in a way, it speaks to that particle and wave um, approach that both Judith and Laura spoke to that I just saw this, oh, if we could cre create communities as healing impulses into a field, how wonderful would that be? So I've spent the last 20 years of my life in the community movement and the past 12 years really leading the Global Eco-Village Network and looking how to how to bring these healing impulses of sustainable communities as healing biotopes out into the world. And I've watched this movement grow to now 6,000 communities on all continents. But at the same time, I've watched these communities run against the edges of both inner and outer fragmentation. The inner fragmentation that all of us carry and the outer fragmentation that our systems carry. And as we go into this time of increased crises in the world, um, I had a deep impulse to move from working more maybe on the, sympt the level of symptoms to going to the roots. And I've had the deep um, joy to um, walk this path of learning with Thomas for the past 15 years. The first part of it, I was very focused on the topic of collective wisdom. Yeah, and now since the Pocket Project was born, really diving into the topic of what is in the way of the unfoldment of our collective wisdom, which is collective trauma. So I just want to show you a few aspects of the Pocket Project. You know, so it's our vision that drives us, restoring the fragmentation of the world, but also, you know, a much bigger vision is what can grow out of that, which is that as we heal the wounds of the past, we can shift towards a path of emergence and evolutionary development of humanity, where we become more and more able to find and express our creativity, implement our solutions. And right now, Thomas already spoke about the new Pocket Project website, which we're super excited about. It's one of the vehicles that we have to express the coherence of what we're creating to all of you and beyond you even. Um, but right now we're still working through the old website, which you can access through pocketproject.org. And one of the first programs I want to introduce you to is that we're offering between 150, these are already guaranteed, to 250, this depends a bit on you all, upgrade packages for the summit to participants from crisis areas, from the global south, from non-majority backgrounds. We are so keen that this knowledge reaches those people that need it most. And who are we to know who needs it most? But we know that by opening more doors, we can open this possibility. So if you want to sponsor a package, if you want to apply for such a package, just visit our website and you will find all the information there. Then as Thomas spoke, I just want to deepen and repeat some of the things that he spoke. Um, the international labs. So these are very specific groups that are looking at specific countries, specific topics of collective trauma that allow us to dig into the historical layering of the trauma, allow us to um, explore all the things that Laura was speaking about. How is it reflected in me? How is it reflected you? How do I feel trauma when I feel myself feeling you or not feeling you? and all the information that is between us in the gaps or pockets that Judith was speaking about. And we're just starting with the first round of labs this autumn. They're starting in November, but you can go and express your interest now. And very soon the applications will be open for these. So we've got individual labs for countries like Argent Argentina, Brazil, um, Israel, Palestine, Germany, Colombia, 
Uruguay, Japan. So go and check it out, but also overall topics like climate change, gender-based trauma, women and gender-based trauma, colonialism, war and its aftermath, etc. So just go and have a look and we'd love to have you with us in this more specific exploration. One project that we just completed, and of course the topic itself is not completed, but we're moving, but this is something that we want to continue doing, which is as crises unfold and you know we're expecting more crises to be with us in the coming decades, how do we ensure that this doesn't lead to more trauma? How can we be with people as we go through intense stress? and support each other to keep connecting to our inner resilience, to the resource of a coherent field, a coherent pocket of people and stay centered. And also especially um, working with healthcare systems, which are so important to our global immune system. So we launched a whole wave of calls when Corona first hit to support collectives in various countries to stay stable. Thomas already spoke about the School of Collective Trauma Integration, which is run as part of the Academy of Inner Science. And there are possibilities here to connect this with academic studies, with your PhD, but also just to come and study, come and learn from whatever professional background you're from and integrate the collective trauma integration work with your alignment of work at this time in the world. Yeah, and Thomas's new book, which will be coming out in November, will be speaking much more deeply to these core stages of co the collective trauma integration process. So again, as we speak about the power of coherence, forming the relational coherence of a group deeply enough so that together we can touch on the repression over that lies over collective trauma and build conduits for collective past to be expressed. Becoming very specific as Thomas was speaking, Laura was speaking about the incredible specificity that Thomas is also able to channel, but that we can also learn to build as coherent groups for specific voices to be seen, to be heard, and then to be synchronized in group work until we come to a possible integration of the process. And with these steps, we also want to reach out to you all um, through the upcoming Collective Trauma Integration Center, which we're developing starting now and in the coming years, um, to bring specific designs for more large scale collective trauma integration processes to your organizations and your countries. This is what we're here for. This is a part of what we're unfolding at this time, and you are all invited to join us, to participate. As Thomas said, this is a movement. This is a global system of coherence that we're spreading out a web. And if you would like to support us through a donation, as a volunteer in translation process, as an active participant, please come speak to us. With that, I just want to stop sharing here. And um, yeah link to the work that we're doing. And with that, I pass it back to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Kosha, and thank you, everybody. So now we get an overview of the different streams. And of course, there's much more to say, but this is kind of the condensed information. I have a few things to say, and then I have a few questions to some of you, and um, I'll get there in a minute. So. Referring back to what you said, Kosher, like, I think also it started with, Thomas, I have an idea. And then we ended up with the <laughs> global aid uh, project when she did, okay, we, let's do this. And so we did it. And, and I think it's, it's beautiful to see and also amazing to honor 
again, everybody that participated, like 50 plus or even 70 facilitators, trained facilitators came together and pro bono supported the kind of global aid project, the COVID uh, intervention for high levels of stress, high levels of uh, agitation or, you know, being threatened uh, through the lockdowns and the crisis and being alone and being separate. And, and I think uh, Yukosha spoke to that there is a collective trauma prevention, which I think is also an important part of the pocket project, also in the future to come for, we see it also with the climate crisis and the changes that are going to come with the climate crisis. So we are building a network of uh, senior uh, facilitators and also facilitators in training, um, where we already brought the group together also from the Mobius Leadership Network, from the Academy of Inner Science and our field that we, there, there are already, uh, there's a quite a big size group of facilitators, but I think for the future for interventions, and interventions might mean kind of prevention interventions as the global aid project or as in crisis areas at the moment. We're also planning to do much more work with people who are on the forefront of current crisis and support people that are active in, in aid organizations. And interventions might be large scale group interventions like acupuncture needles in certain areas on the planet because the original theme or the original tagline for the for the pocket project is one client and one client means the world is an interdependent system where everything affects everything or everybody affects everybody and i think judith you said it beautifully that individual healing has a collective impact there is no individual healing without collective repair and we as collectives are the resonance body, are the remedy for each of every one of our healing processes. And I think that principle, that interdependence is super powerful. And it's because otherwise we might lose hope. We might say, oh, there's so much collective trauma. There were so many wars. There were so many atrocities being inflicted. How can we possibly be done with this? Yeah, we cannot through the thinking of separation, but we can when we take the emergence of the collective witnessing into account because that speeds up our healing capacity by far. And that was my experience in so many groups when I saw that power in action. And I think that's very hopeful. So it means that there is also a tremendous power that lies within us. And uh, so there is the facilitator network and and then i i will hand it over to you Judith, because of the art and because you laura have a question about science and i think one more thing i want to share is that there is a, a tremendous complexity at least in my understanding of collective trauma there's a, a, a high complexity of my individual trauma the transgenerational transmission that I got through my ancestors, my embeddedness in historical trauma and in thousands of years of human traumatization. So that's a complex field. And I think in order to study that field and to develop facilitation skills, it needs a depth of training and it needs also a depth of personal work to be able to, to discern between my personal uh, biographical traumatization and me being able to track and tune in with and be present to the collective field. So it's not something that we open up lightly because there's a lot of energy and information stored in the collective unconscious and it, it makes it a very complex process. And that's why I think a training process is also needed. It includes personal development, it includes collective dynamics, that includes transpersonal development and facilitation skills of larger scale group processes. And so that's what Kosha you referred to when you spoke of the school and the training process. And I'm very happy that we're now um, um, 
in the final steps to to offer this and it will soon be published on our website and then of course i'm i'm a, a deep uh, or i deeply care about the dialogue of science of art and of the mystical arts and uh, and every stream of the interdisciplinary road that we need in order to to open our understanding of collective trauma so and i have two questions one is for you judith maybe to speak a little bit more about um you know your vision how art um can be will be more represented in the poker project in the years to come and maybe laura afterwards maybe you can speak a little bit because we are also um, supporting a lot of scientific research to create scientific data and there is already a group that's working on it for the pocket project for interventions and training programs and the international labs so maybe that you can both speak a little bit to that or any other impulses that come up in you yeah, maybe one thing to, to mention, because when I listened to Kosha and Lara and to you, Thomas, I found it very interesting because I, I really do, I do believe that there are also like different human beings and in each one of us, there are different percentage of the individual, you know, realm within ourselves and the collective awareness, you know. And I think that the fact that even when I hear the story of Kosha, and her path and Laura. So naturally I hear that there was something also like a collective call. And there is something like this, that since you are a child, it might be that you are naturally, there is more space in you as a human being that is available to the collective and not fully only consumed by yourself. And naturally also what you choose to do in your life, you know, like, and if what you choose to do in your life has kind of an interest in the collective field like for example as artists you know we are interested in a wider radius of impact you know so i i am interested that my work will reach out to many people that i don't know from different countries different cultures you know so as a musician as a poet as an artist by the essence of it you have an interest that this mute image will be able to communicate with thousands and you know many many people out there that you don't know that basically are like kind of foreigners to you they are the other you know that don't know you and i think that if we if i try to to, to create a, a connection between these two points is that um i would love to relate to the natural percentage of the collective you know space that you do have sometime as a child you know, the awareness even that Kosha is describing is interesting. Other people will not feel it. They will be more consumed by their life. So what I wanted to point out is that, that I, I, I'm interested also to increase the awareness that when you do your own work in your own individual process, trauma, experience, so the more that you're able to transcend the more of the collective space as you know finds a space also within you as an individual this is part of something that i would love to emphasize and it's very interesting where come even the interest in this collective thing where it comes from some people are not interested in it at all and i would love to um, say that by even what you choose to do in your life if there is something there that carries the interest uh, how the you know a wider radius of humanity will respond to what you do the collective call is is there already as a writer you know it might be as a philosopher as a you know group facilitator as as a historian as and but it's deeper than that so this is one thing that i want to relate to and the other thing is with art of course that my interest is to uh to just to expand the field and to invite filmmakers, uh, poets, artists, people that are dealing with, uh, uh, that they're really interested to offer mainly the quality of experience, that they don't really use just the language in the conventional way that we use, but they are interested in creating environments of experience um, that the viewer can come, take place, and to get something 
that will be, I always said, I call it the virus, but the positive one, that by experiencing this, something gets open in your heart over the time. And this, I think, um, so I start interviewing um, incredible artists from all over the world, artists, you know, high level, that they really dedicate their life for the quality of the mute image, I would say, uh, as filmmakers, as musicians, as artists, poets, and uh, try to um, invite them, you know, through those interviews to describe this space, you know, that they dived in through their personal experience, and they come and they offer this to us as the wider collective space, uh, as those bizarre objects that provide us uh, this quality of experiences that I'm deeply interested in. Um, so we can enjoy them as culture, but not only. So this is like more layers. Um, I would say that this is, um, and of course, um, you know, it's endless. Uh, the vision for the school is incredible. And the idea is to create a very, very complex and three-dimensional, you know, uh, structure from very, very different interdisciplinary fields um, to activate many perspectives to the same topic. I think it's um, fascinating. It's just like, uh, it's rich, it's exciting, and um, it's interesting. Yeah. And then if I might follow on that note, um, on the research side, Thomas, there's several things that I'd like to say. One is that, you know, we called our group Research 2.0 because it seems to us that we really need to rethink how we do research. One of the first things is because nobody is outside of collective trauma. And so when we're looking at objectivity as one of the defining characteristics of scientific discourse, we need to rethink what that means because within that frame, you know, it wouldn't even be possible to create, you know, valid knowledge about collective trauma. And I don't believe that is the case. It seems to me that the capacity for reflecting and being able to look at ourselves um, needs to be incorporated into how can we do that and still um, find knowledge that can be valid and, and applicable in other instances without, you know, staying in that very narrow understanding. Um, another element that seems very important is that we need to be following a perspective of complexity, not so, not so of linear science, because that really does not um, support the understanding of all these different layers that need to come together to be able to address collective trauma. There's also an unfolding of time also needs to happen because we experience collective trauma right now, but the origins and how to understand it really needs for us to rethink um, time. And I think you have brought a, a beautiful way of, of um, conceiving time that makes helps us make sense of the presence of the past and the presence of the future in this same moment. And so tomorrow is not the future if I'm gonna be repeating and stay caught in the same place. And then the future is, if it's not tomorrow, then what is it? It's got to do with creativity, with innovation, with that which is the evolution of you know, the human spirit in this, in this world. And I find that is such an important and fundamental element for us to be able to understand how collective trauma works and how we can get to heal it. So those, those things are, are important. And so we need to look to other kinds of um, of, of theories, of, of ways of conceiving. So it's not just interdisciplinary, but I think transdisciplinary. And the difference there is that transdiscipline uh, is not based on siloed disciplines coming together, but rather it's based on focusing on a specific concrete issue. And then whatever is needed for that issue to be resolved, that's what gets called in. So the organizing principle is that which we're trying to resolve together. So it seems to me a much easier way of, of articulating knowledge that is that's the relevance. So that's to me uh, another element from, from how science has evolved to, to be able to do this. Um, and there's a lot of things to be said about research, but we don't have a lot of time left. So I'd like to you know, hand it back to you, Thomas. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Judith. It was great. And maybe, uh, uh, Kosha, do you have some 
uh, final thoughts? Is anything that uh, came up in you that you want to share before we hand it back uh, over to Robin? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I think I'm just very touched by the, the timeliness of this impulse. You know how impulses come through humanity at the right time. And even the timeliness of the summit, also the deep way in which different um, parts of the field that you're creating are working together to make possible events like the summit. But then the, the attentiveness in the larger human field, while we see the crises unfolding, while we see um, interesting forms of leaders that we are choosing together as collectives, at the same time, we also choose to manifest situations like this online summit where now a hundred thousand people and more from around the planet are coming together to look at these valleys that Judith was speaking about, to look at the pockets and pockets of trauma and pockets of awareness and resilience that we're creating together. So mm -hmm. I'm well, just very touched and excited about this precise moment and the past and the future that is coming together here and now. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I want to underline also what you said now that that I think the Pocket Project is, is one initiative where we are proactively engaging crises that are coming or crises that are happening already or crises that happened that we we have ways to engage it and i think that if we learn how to harvest the energy that is stored in the collective trauma dimension that is often so invisible because it's visible only through symptoms but we're not talking about those symptoms we are talking about the root and i think if we we engage as a collective in 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 noticing it's like how can we get to the fire and not be caught up in the smoke? And I think the fire is where the trauma sits, where the trauma is buried, and where also the transgenerational and collective trauma scars that we have been born into are active and that we are not hypnotized by the symptoms. And I think if we can get to that dimension of frozenness, there's so much life energy and intelligence that can be harvested, that can be used for the innovative capacity that we have all together. So it unleashes a lot of creative and innovative energy. And I think we need that energy to, to build new structures and to be able to change. So the ability to change, I think, is a very important capacity in this time, uh, like that we are able to rapidly change and adapt to the new circumstances that are happening on the planet is very important. And, and I believe all what we heard from all of us and all of you today, I think uh, speaks to that, to that unleashing and the wisdom that is, uh, that is held in there that we can use for the progress of humanity. So I think that's very hopeful. And, um, and I want to, Thank you, first of all, for being here and uh, and hand it over to Robin for some words of closure for today. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Yehudit. Thank you, Kosha. Thank you, Laura, for such an inspiring hour. And I also just really want to thank you, Thomas and Yehudit, for birthing this impulse. You know, never underestimate, I could say to everybody, never underestimate estimate the power of what can happen when somebody says I have an idea and you've taken an idea and it's been fleshed out over four years now into an extraordinary powerful organization that's you know one of the one of the agents in the field this emerging field of working on collective trauma and I'm just very inspired by what I've also been a witness to over these four years it's very strong to feel that and for sure, my own life is changing as I engage with this topic and start to see more and more the, the water in which I'm swimming that I was not so aware of. So it's touching all of our lives, I think. So coming back to the summit, just to remind 
those of us who are here now, the audience, that within the summit, there are five new talks available today for you to watch during the next 48 hours. Over the next couple of days, we'll be releasing four or five talks each day. And those who have signed up for this free summit will receive an email each day announcing the speaker lineup for the day. If you're just finding us and haven't yet signed up for the summit and would like access to all of the free talks, please visit collectivetraumasummit.com. And we also invite you to tell others about the summit because anyone can still join at any time throughout the event and there's still a couple of days left for you to do that. All of the live events from the past week are available to watch on the event recordings page on our website, www.collectivetraumasummit. And I just want to say that some of the live events have also been quite extraordinary, focusing on different aspects of collective trauma, whether it's cultural conditioning or ancestral trauma or transgenerational trauma, like many different aspects under this one umbrella of collective trauma and different live events have really highlighted those. And they've also been laced with poetry and music. They're very powerful. So if you'd like to watch any of those, they're still available to watch on the event recordings page. If you'd like to connect with others who are participating in the summit, please join our Collective Trauma Summit Facebook group. And there are lively conversations happening there. We'd love to have you be a part of that. And if you'd like to download and keep the recordings, because of course there's a lot of them, over 45 talks, you can purchase the Power of Collective Healing Upgrade Package by clicking the button below this video. Or if you're watching on YouTube, click the link in the description box. And the Upgrade Package includes lifetime access to all of the talks in video, audio and written form, more than 30 bonus gifts from our speakers, all at a savings of 50% off during the summit. So just click the button below the video or in the emails we send you. And Kosha also spoke earlier about the scholarship program. So 150 to 250 of these packages will also be available to people from the global south or from non-majority backgrounds. So maybe you're interested to sponsor one of those or, or possibly to apply for one of those. Please do join us later today for a very special live concert from Krishna Das at 1 p.m. Pacific time. That's in three hours time right here on YouTube. That's going to be great also. And do join us again on Thursday for our final live event here on YouTube with Thomas on climate crisis, restoring our relationship to the earth. And Thomas will take us on a guided journey and we will close the summit together in community.